It's the nation's favourite antiques expert. Yeah! Super cool. How about that? Behind the wheel of a classic car. <laughs> and a goal to scar Britain for antiques. <laughs> The aim? To make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners... Yes! ..and valiant losers. Blast it! Will it be the high road to glory... <laughs> ..or the slow road to disaster? Oh, this is the Antiques Road Trip. <laughs> ding, ding! Hello, and good morning from the scenic vistas of East Sussex. Back in the 2CV for another bout. A road trip favourites, Margie Cooper and Raj Bisram. <laughs> good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Always a knockout with the locals. Are you having a good time? I'm having a lovely time. Good. With two rounds under their belts, it's one auction each. During their first round, wrecking Ball Raj came out on top. Well, that's enough now. But Margie, the comeback kid, evened the score at auction two. Happy days. So there's barely a sheet of Bronco between them on this third leg. It's pretty much even Stevens. I think it's about two pounds, 46 pence, but who's counting? I am, of course. Someone has to. Raj has increased his 200 pound starting budget to just over 340 pounds. Whereas Margie has grown hers ever so slightly more to just over 342 pounds. I must have been a little lackadaisical. Now that you're in front, maybe you'll relax a oh, little probably. bit. Most definitely. Yeah, I would. I would just go with the flow today. Just <laughs> buy wherever you see. <laughs> nice try, Raj. After setting out from Eastbourne, our duo headed north through Surrey and back down towards the coast before they scoop westward to finish up in Exeter. We kick off today's shopping in Heathfield with the intention of finishing at an auction in battle, somewhere Raj knows all too well. The last time I was there, yeah. I was with Anita. Yeah. And she sold the Buddha <gasps> for lots of money. Yes, siree! Anita's Buddha smashed the road trip record at that time, selling for a whopping £3,800. Yes! And what a day that was. So whatever you do, do not buy, buy a Buddha. Buddha. Well, I will if I see one. Eyes peeled, everyone. Margie's dropped Raj off in Heathfield, once home to the only man to rival Phil Searle in a scarf, former Doctor Who star Tom Baker. Tinker and Toad is the first shop of the leg. It's a bit of a TARDIS with three floors and 15 rooms. This is really nice. It's a 19th century papier-mâché stationery box and it's really nicely decorated. It's got its original interior still where you could put your letters in. Obviously at the front, you know, you may have kept your stamps, etc. And then, and then your letters and it's in really good condition. And it's got a, a few marks on it, a few scuffs on it. It's got peacocks on the top here and this is all hand-painted as well. For me, this is a proper antique, a really nice little piece. A lovely item, but not priced. Time to speak with dealer Miles. Margaret, aren't you found something? I have found something. I really like this, but it's got no ticket on it. How much can you do that for? What about 65? 40 pounds is my tops. No, you've got a deal. Let's shake hands. OK, brilliant. Thank you. 20, 40. Thank you very much. By Jove, he's off to a good start. That stationary box should do well at auction. But there's plenty more to see here, so let's keep looking. These are quite nice. They've got Stamp Jockey Club Paris on them. They're very damaged, though, but... Miles. Yes, Raj. These. I know they've got a good name on them, but they're not in great condition, are they? Dented everywhere. Uh, no, they're very decorative, though. I'm sure you know that it's a horse racing club in Paris. Yep. Famous for hosting the French Derby. The Jockey Club was originally established as an authority in horse breeding. 
but the club was probably best known for its prestige off the track. It ended up becoming uh, one of the most um, sought after private members club in uh, Paris and they're nice things. Um, you know, the elite went to the club and they're from that time. There's no price ticket on these. Can I make you an offer? Make me an offer. Fifteen pounds. Twenty-five. Split the difference, twenty pounds. Twenty pounds. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Okay, that's with fair. the damage. Brilliant. Another one in the old bag. Good work. Thank you very much. Thank Arjun. you. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. While Raj has been busy, Margie has headed south to the hamlet of Golden Cross, just outside Hailsham. And with £342 to spend, Margie's hoping Golden Cross Antiques will hold a few treasures. You must be Rhoda. I am indeed. Yeah, I'm Margie. Very nice to meet you. Lovely shop. Yes, it is, isn't it? The shop has been trading for over 22 years. Rhoda really knows her onions and likes putting the experts to the test. Now, don't look at the label and see if you can guess what it is. A quiz. Yeah. All right. So, any clues? Looks as though it's going to shave something. Beats me. I honestly haven't got a clue. It's a carpet layers tool. The minute you hear, the minute you know. I would think it's probably about 1900. I like curiosity, that's quite interesting. So what sort of price is that then? Well, I've got 39 on it, I can do a little bit on that. Yeah, that's a thought. One possibility, but what else can Margie find? I think umbrellas are always quite, get a bit of a chance at auction. This is a nice one, 1920s. It's Great, Nick. It's got a brass top here, nice handle. A little bit of mother of pearl there. And I think, do you think it's all right, Rhoda, is it? No holes in it? As far as I know, there are no holes. Good. Yeah. It seemed to be good. Yeah, it looks quite clean, doesn't it? Yeah. It's got that lovely old sort of poplin-y cotton that you don't get on uh, umbrellas today. Quite like it, people collect them. And it's 38 pounds. 1920s, in good condition, an umbrella. What's not to like? <laughs> Whilst Margie keeps looking, let's catch up with Raj, eight or so miles away in Heathfield. He's already spent 60 of his £340 on two items, but he's not finished yet. This is a lovely mirror. I mean, there's so much going on. It's got shields at the side here, look. It's got suits of armour, swords again at the side, and these... These two represent flags with the crown on top. It's cast iron. It's got beveled glass in it. I would have thought this probably would have been used by some kind of military man, but these days it could be anyone. It's so decorative. It's priced at 55 pounds. Let's call Miles over to reflect on the price. Can I make you an offer? You can. What about 30 pounds? Can you get to 40? I'll happily go to 35. It's not, it's not bad, you've got 55 I've on the I've got ticket. money in it, so that's a deal, Rod. Yeah, yep. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic, let me give you some money. Good show. 20, 40. What a collection. The stationery box, jockey club binoculars, and a cast iron mirror, all for 95 pounds. Quite the bold start to his antiques buying on this trip. Meanwhile, Margie's yet to make a purchase. Spoiled for choice, maybe. Come on, girl. Look at this. Gosh, that's a nice piece of embroidery, isn't it? Look at that. That's in good nick. I think that's got a bit of age to it, hasn't it? Victorian Edwardian tea cosy. Never bought a tea cosy before. And if I buy it, you know what'll happen. Raj will put it on his head. <laughs> well, I bet it'll suit him. <laughs> Not put it on my head. <laughs> Try it on for size. <laughs> I'm going to leave him to try on. <laughs> Surely that'd be a bit of fun. It's certainly unusual. Time to talk money. Never bought one of those before. So how much mm -hmm. could that be to me? Well, I've got 15 on it. Yeah. So it could be, what, 
10. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Ten and on this that. has got 38. Yeah. Um, 32. I was thinking 28. Can we meet on 30? Okay. 30 and 10. And 10. All right, 40. Thank you. Good. Thank you Thank very you. much. I hope you do very well on Well, we'll see, won't we? That's for you. Yes, indeed. An umbrella and a tea cosy for a total of £40 sees Margie off the mark too. And while she motors to her next shop, Raj has made his way east to her small so. To learn about the origins of the famous garden basket known as the Sussex Trug. Hello there. Oh, hello. It's not Robin, isn't it? Yes, it is. Hi, I'm Raj. Nice Hi, to Raj. meet you. Nice to meet you. Robin has been making the iconic wooden baskets for over 30 years, but the origins of the Sussex Trug are far, far older. The history of the Trug goes back uh, over a thousand years, really, to Anglo Saxon times when they used quite heavy wooden vessel and they were known as trogs and it was used on farms in the Sussex area to measure grain and liquid and then in the 1820s Thomas Smith of Hurston Zoo reinvented the trog and called it a trug. It's made using sweet chestnut for the handle and rim and that's coppice locally in Sussex and the boards are made from cricket bat willow. When redesigning the cumbersome trog, Smith took inspiration from the slat design of clinker boats, which allowed his trug to be both light and strong. The trug quickly became indispensable to the agricultural industry, allowing easy transportation of goods long before mechanisation. And thanks to the abundance of willow and chestnut in the area, trug making quickly became an important Sussex industry, with many makers setting up shop. Caleb, one of the new generation of trug makers, wants to show Raj the first step in making the handle and rim. We've got chestnut here split out into triangle pieces, and what we want is this white bit of wood here. It's the nice bendable part of the chestnut. We use the cleaving axe to split, so if you want to go ahead... Yeah, about, about that. There. Yep. yep, that's OK. OK. Yep, and then? And then put it in the break. It's what we call a break. It's all paying attention on the split and trying to control it because you don't want the split to come out to the bark. How's this looking, Caleb? Yep, excellent. Oh, I'm a natural. OK, great. So that's your piece almost ready. Yeah. That's... Um, it's still rough, obviously, because yeah. we've split through the grain and you get rough bits. So now what we need to do is go inside, finish it off with a draw knife and shaving it. He's proved himself in the splitting shed but how will Raj do in the workshop? And uh, this, what do you call this? You put the piece of chestnut into the clamp and you use your feet to push the clamp forward. And so I just shave it this way? Yep, nice firm strokes towards you. The idea here is to get to the right width and the right depth. So how, how long would this normally take uh, someone who's a bit experienced to couple, get? A couple of minutes. I'm not going fast enough, am I? I'm trying to be careful, well, actually. When you start, it takes a while. <laughs> so, I mean, how popular, Robin, were trugs? Because there were a lot of companies around here that made them. There were. There were, um, in the Hurston Zoo area alone, there were 24 trugs in, in its heyday. But they were very important because during the two world wars, trug making was a reserved occupation. So they didn't actually have to go off to war. That shows how important this industry was, the agricultural area, and this was, you know, part of it. Exactly, yes. At its peak, trug making was a thriving industry across much of the south coast. Over 200 companies between Kent and Somerset were producing trugs, doing their part to keep the nation fed during a time of great need. So this is the final process where we put the willow boards into the frame and it actually starts to look like a trug. We use copper tacks. Uh, why do you use copper tacks? Copper doesn't rust, so if, if you use wet garden stuff in there, the fixings are perfectly fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, they're the first three boards in. Uh, OK. Do you want to take over? Yeah, I'll give it a go. You want to grab one of these boards... OK. And ...just place in it there. in the trug there. So what you want to do is put a hole in the willow. OK, there. That's it. So then you use a copper tack 
And so that goes so into it just goes this. straight in the hole you've made, yep. And then, and then just hammer it. Okay, that's great. By the end of the Second World War, traditional farming was changing to mechanisation. Trugs were no longer needed to scatter the corn or pick the vegetables, and the trug-making industry declined. However, an upsurge in allotments after the war meant the Sussex trug went from agricultural to horticultural, where it has remained ever since. An iconic piece of British gardening. Robin, tell me, what do you think? My first trug. Well, you've made a good job there, Raj. Thank you very much indeed. What a pleasure. Now then, how's Margie getting on? Unless I see something amazing, I just want to maintain my lead. I don't want to take the gamble. I mean, I've never bought a tea cozy before. <laughs> I think uh, Raj will uh, get a bit of fun out of that. Margie's making her way north to the village of Hurst Green. With the intention of spending some of her £300 at Aaron Antiques. Oh, oh, this looks good. Anybody here? Hello, you must be Marjorie. I am, that's the very one. Pleased to meet you. And you're Ron. Ron Goodman. Great stuff. So you're going to show me around? You're going to show you around, yeah. find me some nice little bits that's and pieces. It. Now we'll look and see if we can have a deal. I'm going to follow, follow you. Come on, then. Yeah. Oh. oh, Ron. I'm getting called up. Ron, what are you doing? Careful, Ron. Now have a good look around. Aaron Antiques has an eclectic mix of collectibles and curios inside and out. Are they lovely boxes? Well, they're a bit jiggered, aren't they? Just old document boxes, aren't they? Safe boxes for all your paperwork and deeds and... This is a nice one. I think this had a military hat in yeah. there, yeah, with the brass's name on there. I'd love to have the hat that was in there. Oh, have you not got the hat? Right. No, that's gone to head office. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, how much are they? You can have the lot for 120 quid. What's that over there, that thing? It's at the top of a barrel. I think, yeah, it's old. It's old. Let's, let's have a look at that. Right, so who's Wadworth & Co? Listen, to the right person, Wadworth & Co means a lot to them. <laughs> That's probably 19th century, isn't it? It's unusual. Look. I can't believe you're trying to sound with the lid off a barrel. I mean, it's a bit of folk art, isn't it? I mean, it's... That's been outside a pub for many years, hasn't it? If that was on an online auction, it'd probably make two or three hundred quid, that. Oh, run old. But 40 quid, I'll sell it. I mean, I'm not... I just want to sell stuff, you know, just... Well, £20 by it. What's eight. worth... How much? 20 Oh, you want to deal with all them tins as well, so we'll do a deal on the lot. How much should I say for them tins? Can't remember. My mind's... Well... My... I, I do we... forget. I do no, forget. No. I think we started at 120. Oh, you never did. Wait, I'll tell you what, I take 80 quid. Oh, no. 100 pound the lot. No. 20 quid, 50 quid. Done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've done it now. Yeah, you've done it. There you I've are. I've done it now. Can, can, look, can somebody call the police? I think, <laughs> listen, I think I've been mugged. <laughs> 40, 60. And a 70. Oh, that's wonderful. 70 for the barrel top sign and metal boxes. Good work, Margie. And with that deal, I think it's time to call it a day. Time for our duo to join up again. Do you think I could sit in the back while you're driving? <laughs> I think that would be really nice. I'm not nervous, are you? No, no. Well, what I was thinking more is if I could buy you a cap. <laughs> and, you know, maybe you could drive me round. <laughs> I think it's time Miss Daisy went to bed. <laughs> Nighty night. It's a new day, and our twosome are raring to go. Margie! <laughs> Sun is shining, the it top is. is down, and here we are in my oh, home county of Kent. So you're not far from home. Not really, no, not well, at all. Miles from my home. If you get homesick, I'll take you to my home, OK? <laughs> now, there's an offer you don't hear every day. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yesterday, our budding host had a productive day bagging the stationery box, the jockey club binoculars and the cast iron mirror. That's a deal, Rod. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Which means he still has a smidge over £245 left to spend. While Margie bought the Edwardian umbrella, the tea cosy, the barrel top sign and a collection of metal boxes. What's not to like? <laughs> giving her a comfortable £232 for the day ahead. You're in for a surprise, you know, because... Am I in for a surprise? Yeah, because I've got a little present for you. <gasps> I can't because I'm driving, but if you have a look on the back seat, OK, have a look. Oh, my goodness. Did you make that? Yes. Oh, my, a little truck. It's not a little truck, it's quite a big truck. Well, I think it's brilliant. How long did that take you? Oh, I, I think it took me a couple of minutes. <laughs> Your nails are not lined up very well, are they? Oh, God, here we go. <laughs> here we go, indeed. We've that auction in battle still to come, but first our duo are motoring their way in the direction of Lenham. Situated on the very edge of the North Downs, the village is host to the first shop of the day for both our experts, which could be trouble. Hey. Here we are, Margie. Hey. What a lovely place. Isn't it lovely, with a lovely square? Oh, Here we go. Now. All yeah. friends now. Well, we're off to battle, aren't we? <laughs> Let the battle begin. Good luck. <laughs> you coming? Yeah, I'm coming. Hello. Ladies first and all that. Oh, right. Which way do you want to go? This is lovely. I tell you what, you go that way, I'll go this way. That's the best way. Corner House Antiques calls this medieval building home. There's a wide selection of goodies spread across six rooms, certainly plenty of space and stock for both Raj and Marge. <laughs> and what's this? Well, this chair, which is quite an unusual shape, is called a prix d'eur, and it's from France. It's a praying chair. What you had to do was you had to literally kneel on them, and this is how you would pray. Please, let me beat Margie. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to need prayers. Originally used by clergy during religious services, pre dieu chairs became popular during the 19th century for praying at home. This one is priced at £95. I mean, this is quite unusual because it's got this bobbin turning here and it's got this rush seat. And normally they would have been upholstered. They're not the best sellers, that's the reason I'm, I'm not buying it. But that's what it's called, a pre dieu chair. Well, you'd better keep looking then. Where's Margie ended up? Like, what are these? Oh, they look nice, aren't they? Oh, I like things like this. Embossed leather. Well, there obviously is something for um, when you're playing a game. This is how you do the score, isn't it? Yeah. Aren't they nice with the different coats of arms? I wonder which ones they are. Maybe something to do with bridge or something, which I don't play. There's no price. I'm going to ask Lynn. I like these. Oh, I didn't notice that. What's this? It's a flask, isn't it? Well, that's an old thing, isn't it? Victorian, this. But, you know, that lovely old glass. Look at it, old Ripley, look. Bit flasks were Victorian de rigueur. Popular accessories on hunts, fishing trips, for your favourite tipple. That's lovely, isn't it? Like the glass. Yeah, that's all right. I wonder if that'll do a, a little parcel. Fingers crossed, because there's no prices on them. Fingers crossed that she'll do me a deal. Right, Lynn, I found a couple of things without prices. Hope we can do a deal. These are all right, aren't they? Aren't they colourful? Yeah, yeah, they're really nice, well, aren't they? Sort of scorecards for yeah, yeah. cards, is it yeah. bridge or something? Bridge markers. Yeah. Do you play bridge? I don't. I don't. So how much could those be? 20 quid. Oh, and I also find that funny old thing. Yeah. 15 pounds? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 30, oh, that's marvellous. 35, I've got to make a profit. You've been very, very kind. Yeah, good luck. And that's 40. The hip flask and scoring cards make for an unusual combined lot. Thank you. Fingers crossed it'll do well at auction. And with Margie off the premises, Raj has the place to himself. 
Well, I am always drawn to Tunbridge Ware. It's local to me. I don't live far away from Tunbridge Wells. And it was invented by a man called James Burroughs. And what Tunbridge Ware really is, it's like wooden mosaics. Tunbridge Ware was sold as souvenirs from the famous Kent Spa town in the 19th century. And this is tempting fate, too, because something similar cost Raj dear in the last auction. It'd be a gamble. This one's a ruler here, and it's in lovely condition, this. This is really, really nice. And, th and these were all made around 1830. Uh, that's when it started, to, to the 1900s. And here we've got something that's really un a little bit unusual, which is thread wax. What the thread wax is used for is you would just put the th end of the thread onto the wax, which would make it a bit harder and would make it much easier to thread through the needle. On this ticket, it's got 58, and on the ruler, 65, but there are a lot of collectors of these. Hi, Lynn. Hello there. I found something. Can I make you an offer? You can try. I was thinking of offering you, for the two items, 55 pounds. Ouch. What about 65 pounds? What about we split the difference and we call it 60 pounds? Okay. You sure? Yep. Brilliant. Sure. Let's shake hands on it then. Yeah. Fantastic. 60. Thank you very Thank much. You. Let's hope 60 pounds for the Tunbridge Ware won't rule out a profit. <laughs> now, where's Margie found herself? Well, she's made her way to the village of Biddenden. To meet third generation vintner Julian Barnes. Hello, Julian. Hello, Roger. Hi. I brought my truck. Brilliant. It's a special truck. Sussex. Sussex. Brilliant. Let's so go and put some grapes in it. Great, thank you. Crikey, that's a lot of grapes. Once dismissed by connoisseurs, English vineyards today produce many world-class wines. Something Julian's family has been very proud to be a part of. We're a family business, approaching our 50th anniversary and yeah. growing some of the oldest vines in England. But winemaking in Britain actually dates back almost 2,000 years to the Romans, who planted several vineyards around England, even as far north as Lincolnshire. But viniculture didn't truly make its mark until 1066, when the Norman king, William the Conqueror, took to the throne, and with him came the French passion for winemaking. At the time of the Doomsday Book, 46 vineyards were recorded in southern England alone, producing still wine, often on monastic sites. But in the 15th century, everything changed. Around Henry VIII's time, it went very cold ah. and it sort of dried up as an industry, yeah. which brought an end to it at that particular time. So that's still wine. So what about the sparkling wines? The French had some still wine that started to ferment. Yeah. And then the understanding of that process was actually a paper that was written in England by Christopher Merritt. So it was oh, an English right. understanding of, of sparkling wine. And then because our... Uh, coal-fired uh, glass production yeah. produced a stronger bottle. Oh. We were actually able to take those two elements and put them together to become, oh, right. you know, quality sparkling wine in a bottle. In chilly northeastern France, an accidental second fermentation caused by the cold created CO2 in the wine, making them ticking time bombs, and bottles exploded. Monks, many of whom were winemakers, called it the devil's wine. But the tougher glass used to make bottles on this side of the channel meant Brits were enjoying fizz 30 years or so before a French monk called Dom Perignon perfected the art of making sparkling wine in the 1690s. A renaissance in English and Welsh wine started in the 1950s. So what kind of grapes, what variety are these? So these are Ortega. Which Ortega. We've been, yeah, which we've been growing since 1972, so some of the oldest vines in England, and it makes a fruity, aromatic white wine. So where does the Ortega grape come from, then? It's grown widely in an area in Germany called Würzburg. We found that over there and have brought that over. The system we're growing on here is off the ground, so we've got good airflow underneath the vines, and then we've got protection from above from things like hail and obviously the rain as well that we get in this country. Is there a bottle there? Not quite. They look great, don't they? Right, I'm going to try one, yeah? Yeah, off right. you go. Mmm. They're quite 
quite sweet, aren't they? Yeah. Have well, you got any in a bottle? Give us a off you go. We're going to try a glass. <laughs> Would can, it be yeah. possible? Yeah. Shall we go and find some? That's very kind of you. <laughs> well, it is thirsty work, all this chat. <laughs> some bottles. Yeah. How marvellous. Let me put my truck down. This is from 2016. Right. Thank you very much. Join, join me in a drink, Julia. <laughs> and your That's drink. What I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> you taste it. Mm. That's lovely, isn't it? Mm, very fruity. I tell you what, Raj will be furious. He's made a trug. <laughs> and I'm having all the fun. <laughs> Cheers, Raj. And thanks for the trug. <laughs> oh, dear. Lovely. Today, there are over 500 vineyards in the UK producing award-winning wines. I'll raise a glass to that. Let's see how Raj is getting on. This, so far, has been a really wonderful road trip. Margie is such a lovely lady. We've had a lot of fun. Haven't you just? Raj is heading east towards the village of Beversden. He's making a beeline for the final shop at the lake, Simmons Salvage, with his remaining £185. Walking well, too. Hello. Hi. Nice Boya. to meet you. What an amazing place. It's huge. I'm either going to need a sat-nav or you to show me round. Oh, I can show you. Don't worry. Let's go. Excellent. <laughs> with thousands of pieces of stock. It was absolutely massive here. Set over three acres, Moya needs to take him past the architectural salvage to find the antiques and curios. Moya, do you know, this takes me back to being at school. You know, this is like one of the, the horses that we had. Where did you get this from? You must have got it from an old school. Yeah, we did, yeah. Um, yeah, they were clearing out and re refurbishing the gym and we bought all of the gym equipment. What on earth would you use something like this for now? Uh, people use them for upcycling. I've seen one made into chest of drawers, coffee tables, because they come apart. So you can make, obviously, multiple coffee tables. What sort of price are you looking for this? 150 Yeah, 150 the best, really. I have I have absolutely no idea what these things fetch, but what about if I said £100 no, I and go made that it low. cash? I couldn't go that low. 120 okay. would be the best. I just like it. It's just different. I'm going to buy it. Excellent. 120? Sir. Fantastic. Thank you uh, so much. Okay. 100, 120. Well, the vaulting horse for £120 is the last and most expensive purchase of the leg. Good work. Time to pick up Margie and get going because you know what the next stop is. Onwards to battle. Literally. Yeah, the to battle, do battle. The battle continue. Yeah. There's not much in it. This could be the one where... The turning point. The turning point, Margie, the turning point. Time will tell. But for now, let's get some shut-eye. It's auction day. Welcome to the historic town of Battle, where the abbey was built to commemorate the Battle of Hastings. A fitting place for today's ding-dong. Our third auction. I know. Two pounds in it. Everything to I play know. for. Are you ready to be trounced? Ah, uh, of course I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to be trounced. Where's your fighting spirit, Raj? Oh, Get vertical. After setting off from Heathfield, our twosome have hot-footed their way across much of the southeast before winding up here. Today's auction is being held at Burstow and Hewitt. On this leg of the trip, Margie spent a modest £145 on five lots. A tea cosy. Haven't these gone a little bit out of fashion? It's more useful as a hat in the cold weather. I have to say, the embroidery is rather nice, and as a decorative item, it might sell, but don't hold your breath. Raj also bought himself five lots, spending a grand total of £275. I can't say I like this too much. 
I always think the black cast iron is so funereal. It's, it's an antique, but oh, I don't think it's got that appeal, has it? In charge of the sale room today is auctioneer Mark Ellen. What does he think of our experts' items? At 35, they're selling them. The Victorian parasol has a very nice mother of pearl and gold plated handle. It's not dented, it's all there, and we have got some good collectors of parasols, so I think that one should sell fairly easily. I think my favourite item of the whole lot is the vaulting horse, which really reminds me of school days and, funnily enough, also the Great Escape. I think that's a great item, fairly useless really, unless you're into vaulting, but it's just interesting and it's different. Nice to sell different things here. Today, Mark will be selling to bidders in the room, on the phone and online. Right, plonk yourself down. It is time to begin. Here we are again. Exciting. <laughs> Will we see profits? Raj's mirror is up first. Because of all the armorial pieces around the mirror, yeah. I think it should attract. That's the point. Because it had like a crown on the top. Oh, it's got it's got all sorts. It's got it's got flags. Oh. It's got suits of armour. Oh. You didn't look at it properly, did you? Well, it's so black and boring that I didn't bother. <laughs> And I've 30 bits to start. 35 back in the room now. Oh, come on, come on. 40, 45, 50, 50 yes, that's 55, what I yes. Oh, yes, keep 50, 60 online, 65 at the back of the room. I was wrong. 65. You were wrong. 70. Yes, very 70 wrong. 80. 85. Well, 85. 85, all done then. Well. Blimey, that's a good start to the day. I apologise yes. profusely. <laughs> you never have to apologise. That's what love is all about, Margie. Oh, he's a sweetie and a smoothie. Next, it's the umbrella. The auctioneer had high hopes for this. I think it's one of your best lots. Really? Yeah. Oh. 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, all on. 45 bid, 50 against you now. 50, 55, oh my 60 goodness. with me. 65, 70. Oh, you're joking. 70. For the last time, it's 70. More than doubled your money there, girl. Well done. You see? Now I'm shocked. Next, out of the gates, the Jockey Club binoculars. Can you see a profit? <laughs> Can you see a profit? Paul, say 20 for these then. 20. Oh, no. 15 pounds then, come on. 15 pounds. You're not taking them home, are you? Well, 10 then, come on. 10 pounds there at 10. Yeah, I've got a tenner. 10 pounds on oh, I've only lost half my money. Room bidder at 15. At 15 pounds then for the last time then. Ah, oh, what a shame. Well, they were a bit bashed. Thank you very much. The upside. At 101, you go to. It's a loss. Maybe the tea cosy will warm the bidders up. I only bought it so you could put it on your nut. Well, I think, to be honest, that's all it's good for. <laughs> I think I'll need this in a, in a few weeks, when, the, when it cools down a bit. Oh, no, <laughs> it's got like the same idea as I have. Anyone say 20 for this one? 15, come on, 15 oh, pounds no, it's not going to sell. 10, then, come on, 10 pounds in the doorway. 10. 10 pounds on bid for it. Oh, thank goodness. Come on, 15, thank you very oh, much. On the right at 15. 15. <laughs> no, selling at the top of the run, but 15 pounds, it's going then. It made a profit, albeit a fiver. Ah, oh, oh, you see, you did all right. Marvellous. Right, Raj's Tunbridge wear up next. You love your Tunbridge wear, don't you? I do. Forty pounds for those. Thirty, I'll take for them. What about the net? Twenty-five pounds for them here on the net. Yes, thirty room bidder. Thank you. Just beat you to it online. Thirty-five here now at thirty-five pounds. So oh, cheap. Forty pounds. Thirty-five. I am shocked. Thirty-five pounds on the net here then. Ouch! Someone's got a bargain there. Right, I'm giving up on wear. I'm not buying any more tummage wear. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Me and tummage wear. It's You've finished. Got to <laughs> I never want to see another no. piece in my life. No, no. Now, are there any bridge players in the room? Stand by. Uh, I've no idea what these are going to do. I like these. I do like these. And I'll take 30 for this group. £30, thank you. £30, I'm bid for them. Train at 30 no. £30 in Norway. For the last time they're going. At £30, they're yours then. Only a small loss. But who's keeping the score? Oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> I feel sorry for you. OK, you've lost a fiver. <laughs> you must be so upset. Here, shall I get some water? <laughs> Next, Raj's biggest purchase in more ways than one. Let's hope this helps me get back in the saddle. Well, I mean, <laughs> we'll put it in the car park, see if you can do it. No problem. You rip your trousers. If it, if it, if it makes 300, I'll, I'll try and jump over it. <laughs> OK. Paul's starting at £100 then for this. 
100 would you say for it? 100 bid, thank you. 100, 100 bid. Well, I'm, still, I'm still behind. 100 pounds. It's online then. Need nothing it's in the room. Fair warning, at £100, it's yours then. More of a stumble than a vault. Never mind. No that's jumping for joy there. You don't have oh. to jump it then. You don't have to vault well, it. Well, that's one thing. That's so one you won't thing. split your trousers. <laughs> oh dear. That's a silver lining, I suppose. Time now for that barrel top sign. I'm not sure that Three, it's two, that old. One, two, nine. Oh, it looks it. It looks it. Oh. And I've 25 bid on the net here. 25 bid. Profit. You've got a profit. At 20, 30 we're up to. 35. 40. 40 we're up to now. At Let's 40. Shove it up a bit. Oh. On this. All done. At 40 pounds. Selling here now then. Margie will be pleased with that. Well done. I think. Pounds. I don't know who's right, whether it is old or not. It doesn't matter. You made a profit. Which is something Raj badly needs to do. His stationary box is next. It was a brilliant buy, a brilliant buy. You watch, watch it fly. And we're straight in here at £50 online bidder. £50 bid for it, 55 now down here. 60 online again, 65. 70, 75. There you go, 80, somebody wants 85, it. 90, 95 again oh. at 95. At £95, the bidding's here now then. That was a great find, an overdue profit for Raj. And I'm happy with that. Yeah, that's oh, great you are. And so he should be. Last to go under the hammer is the collection of metal boxes. Well, I think they're going to do really well on these. Paul we'll say £50 to start. Thank you. £50 bid. £50 bid for them. £50, £55, £60. They're going to make 70. 100. New bidder on the left here now. £70, 70 75 80 85 100. £100, thank you. £100. Oh, £110 yeah. now in the door. £110 or more. £120. £120. 130 in Oh, the town, my word. The happy now. days. Oh, yeah, happy selling. days, All definitely. £130 then. Fantastic. Oh, £80. Pounds. Oh. £80. Pounds. Oh. <laughs> what a great way to end. Well, you've done brilliantly today. I have to say that I'm, I've gone off tumbridge wear, I've gone off vaulting horses, and if you keep laughing like that, I'm going to go off you. Come on, let's go. Time to crunch the numbers. Raj started this leg with just over £340 in his piggy, but after sale room fees, he made £4 loss today, leaving him with just over £336. What a player. Margie, on the other hand, made an £88 profit after fees, meaning she retains her lead and has over £431 to spend on the next leg. Wow. Well done, well done. I think I'm going to have my new nickname for you <laughs> is now Moneybags. OK? That's two auctions to Margie.